We have four more minutes. I request all of our dear brethren to settle. Please, all of you, uh, mute your mic. Greeting, brother. Can you hear me? Yes, we can yes. hear you well, brother. Okay. Brother Edward, I have a question. I'm not sure if it should go to you or Brother Egbu, but uh, just for my timing, um, I wasn't careful in uh, noticing I had 45 minutes. I was thinking I had an hour. Uh, I noticed that there's a half an hour in between my talk and Brother Joe Dolan's talk. So I'm wondering if I should speak very fast or if I could use a little bit of that half an hour uh, to finish up the talk. Brother, as I, uh, your allotted time is 45 minutes, brother. And okay. We have a, and we have a question and answer session uh, regarding um, the discourse. Yes, I yeah, welcome. Yeah, that will be for 30 minutes. So, so you can take uh, 45 minutes to one hour for your discourse. Okay. All right. Great. Thank you. Yes. And 15 minutes will be for your uh, question session. Okay. Thank you very much. I should greet things from our Ecclesia, brothers. Brother we Eliza, we welcome and you. We, we welcome you, brother. Joining just now, we have just finished the party to join you. Welcome to Eliezer. Welcome to area Bible students. They are joining you. Nice to see all of you again. Nice to see you. Morning, brother Edward. Oh, brother Ed. Good to see you. Welcome. Welcome. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, Good morning. Good morning brother. It's early, uh, brother early morning. It's time to start. Okay, Japan, I think uh, that we can start. Brother yeah. <clears throat> Kajitan, shall we start? Yes, yeah, start. Yes, thank you. Uh, uh, dear brothers and sisters from the four corners of the world. Yeah. Uh, dear. <laughs> Dear brethren, please. Uh, dear brethren, please uh, mute your mics. Uh, dear brothers and sisters from the four corners of the world. So, uh, I am Brother Edward Aragasami from India, and uh, thanks for giving me this opportunity uh, uh, to to act as a chair a chairperson for this session. I am very thankful to Nigerian Bible students for giving me this opportunity, especially Brother Kajitan. And today, uh, we are going to start this session with a opening hymn 66, Sweet By and By. Brethren, could you kindly play this song, please? Thank you. 
Thank you, uh, thank you, Brother Kajetan, for this wonderful uh, song. Now I request Brother Alex Forinjam to uh, give you an opening prayer. Over to Brother Alex Forinjam. Brother Alex? Brother Alex Forinjam? Brother Alex from Cameroon. Okay, if 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 Brother Alex Forenjum is not here, I request Brother Miroslav to uh, give you an opening prayer. Thank you. Let's bow our heads, <clears throat> hearts before the Lord's throne. Our wonderful and dear Heavenly Father, hallowed be your name. Thank you for this wondrous privilege wondrous grace dear father that we can as your spirit begotten children your sons and daughters approach in front of your holy throne through the service of our high priest and advocate jesus to express our devotion heavenly father to you and pray for your blessing upon this third day of this nigeria general bible students convention and we pray for the blessing of all participants, all brothers who uh, prepare their talks, and bless their studies, that that will be really a blessing to all of us and uh, open our minds and uh, made our hearts uh, 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 that they accept this, this message, that this uh, do not be only the informations in our heads, but that we continue to be sanctified by your word of the of truth and on that way complete our transformation and be ready for our change according to your will we pray for your spirit especially now for the services in front of us for this uh, morning the de devotion program and also upon the brother dan monet who will have a first talk we pray all of this heavenly father in the name of our glorious king Reaper and Bridegroom, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Thank you, uh, Brother uh, Braslo <clears throat> Burek from Croatia for your nice prayer. Now I request Sister Elizabeth Odili from Abuja Ecclesia to read the morning result. Over to Sister Elizabeth Odili. Good morning, brothers. My name is Elizabeth Odili from Abuja Ecclesia. My morning result. My early thought I desire shall be, what shall I render unto the Lord for all his benefits towards me? I will take the cup of salvation and call upon the name of the Lord for grace to help. I will pay my vows unto the Most High. Psalm 116, verse 12 to 14. Remembering the divine call, gather my sins together unto me. Those who have made a covenant with me by sacrifice. Psalm 50, verse 5. I resolve that by the Lord's assisting grace, I will today, as a saint of Sister, unmute your mic, please. Sister Elizabeth, could you kindly unmute your mic? Okay. You. That I may attain to the heavenly inheritance in the joint headship with my Redeemer. I will strive to be simple and sincere towards all. I will seek 
not to please and honor self, but the Lord. I will be careful to honor the Lord with my lips, that my words may be uncautious and blessed to all. I will seek to be faithful to the Lord, the truth, the brethren, and all with whom I have to do, not only in great matters, but also in the little things of life, trusting myself to divine care and the providence overruling of all my interests. For my highest welfare, I will seek not only to be pure in heart, but to repel all anxiety, all discontent, all discouragement. I will neither murmur nor repine at what the Lord's providence may permit, because faith can firmly trust, trust him. Come what may. I read in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, uh, Sister Elizabeth Odeli, for reading the morning result. Now I request Brother Matthew Okafor from Onitsha Ecclesia to read the O unto the Lord. Over to Brother Matthew Okafor. Brother Matthew Okafor, can you please read the O unto the Lord? If it's not available, can someone? Brother Kajetan, can you read, please? I read. <laughs> Thank you, brother. Thank you. Okay. A vow unto the Lord. Our okay. Father, okay. our Father, which art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name. May thy rule come into my heart more and more, and that will be done in my mortal body. Relying on the assistance of thy promised grace to help in every time of need, through Jesus Christ our Lord, I register this vow. Daily, we I remember at the throne of heavenly grace, the general interest of the harvest work, and particularly, the share which I myself am privileged to enjoy in that work and they their collaborators everywhere. I have to steer more carefully, if possible, scrutinize my thoughts and words and doings to the intent that I may be the better and able to serve thee and thy dear flock. I have to do that I will be on the lot to resist everything akin to spiritism and occultism. And remembering that there are by the two masters, I shall resist these snails in all reasonable ways as being of the adversary. I further vow that with the exceptions below, I will at all times and in all places conduct myself toward those of the opposite sex in private exactly as I would do with them in public in the presence of a congregation of the Lord's people. And so far as reasonably possible, I will avoid being in the same room with any of the opposite sex alone, unless the door to the room stand wide open. Exceptions in the case of brethren, wife, children, mother and natural sisters, in the case of sisters, husband, children, father and natural brothers, may God add his blessings in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you, brother. Now I request by the God's will, Egbo, from Amaswama by Sayaklisha to read the mana text, to read today mana text. Over to the God's will Egbo. Brother God's will Egbo, can you read today mana text, please? Brother, please unmute your mic. Brother God's will Egbo, please unmute your mic. Okay. Our man text this morning is taken from the book of Psalm. It's taken from the book of Luke chapter 2, verse 49. And it reads, We see not that I must be about my father's business. The comment. Should we not all have the master's spirit expressed by his words? The last true saints have no business of their own 
for they gave their all to the Lord at consecration. Their business they manage as trustees for the Lord, not to be turned over at their death in prosperous condition to their children or their friends, possibly to their injury. It is to be used by the trustee as wisely as he knows how before death, for then his trusteeship ends and he must render his accounts. May the Lord add his blessings. Amen. Amen. Thank you, brother. Thank you, uh, brother God's will like for reading the today's daily manna. Thankful to you. Now I request brother Dan Monat to give you a discourse uh, titled Air Megadon. Brother Dan Monat, over to you for your kind information. The discourse time is 45 minutes. Yes, you can take some more 15 minutes. And after that, there will be a question and answer session on your discourse. Over to brother Dan Monat. Thank you, brother. Thank you, brother Edward. And thank you, brother Myro, for the opening prayer. And good morning or good afternoon or possibly good evening to all of you brethren and what a joy what a blessing it is to see all of you and to be with you uh, at this convention and we thank the nigerian bible students for all the efforts and all who have had any part in bringing us together that we might consider the beautiful plan of God and his great love for us. And it's a great joy to be with you. And we want to bring to you the love of our class, the Oakland County Bible students in Michigan, and also the Toronto area Bible students and love from our dear wife, Sister Connie. Brethren, our assigned topic today is Armageddon. We wouldn't have chosen this topic not being confident in our ability to teach this subject. But we're thankful that the brethren have chosen this subject for us because it was a great blessing for us to consider this great future event. And we leave this hour in the Lord's hands and pray that we would be used as his mouthpiece. And we pray that we might bring a blessing to you, that you might receive a blessing we certainly uh, we're blessed by the Lord in our consideration. That being said, let's read our theme text found in Revelation, the 16th chapter and verse 16. Revelation 16, 16. And he gathered them together into a place called, in the Hebrew tongue, Armageddon. Brethren, this is the only place you will find the word Armageddon in the Bible. Yet Armageddon is a well-known word, not only to Christians, but to the world. In fact, the mention of Armageddon sends shivers down the spine of most people, bringing to their minds horrible pictures of destruction and mayhem. It conjures up words like nuclear holocaust, doomsday, apocalypse, and so on. Armageddon has been the subject of movies and novels, that have filled its viewers and readers with doom and gloom. These fictional stories have no real constructive purpose, but the true story of Armageddon found in the Bible does. And this is the story we're privileged to know and to tell, brethren. Our story has a purpose and it has a happy ending. So we're going to begin today with the end of our story because this is the part of the story the groaning creation really needs to hear. Our story is not a story of the destruction of the earth and its people. Ours is a story of the destruction of the corrupt systems of this world and its ruler, Satan, who will be fully bound. And following this destructive work, when every mountain and hill that is the kingdoms of this world are made low, that is, removed, then every valley, that is, the poor, suffering world of mankind, shall be exalted. They'll be lifted up, made whole, and made perfect. Isaiah 40 and verse 4. 
What an awesome story we have to tell. That this world's wide trouble called Armageddon isn't the end of man and earth, but a new beginning. A new heavens and a new earth reorganized on a basis of love and justice rather than might and oppression under the benevolent reign of Messiah, wherein the inhabitants of the world will learn righteousness. Isaiah 26, verse 9. Brethren, as children of light, we see this hope beyond Armageddon and must tell it to others, the groaning creation around us, to give them a glimmer of hope. We've told the end of the story. Now the rest of the story, the details, the what, where, when, why, and how of Armageddon. That is, what is the Bible story of Armageddon? Where does it take when does it take place? Why is it necessary? And how does Armageddon come about? Two observations before we begin. First, as we studied this topic, we were continuously reminded of man's great sufferings under the present selfish and unjust rulers and the need for their removal and replacement. Secondly, we were reminded of the positive loving purpose of the trouble connected with Armageddon, and that is to prepare man's heart to receive the blessings of the new kingdom, God's kingdom on earth. Before considering the details, let's look at the big picture of the what, where, when, why, and how of Armageddon. What is the Battle of Armageddon in a few words. It's a great contest between truth and error, right and wrong. In this contest, wrong will be completely and everlastingly overthrown, making way for the permanent establishment of Messiah's righteous kingdom for man's blessing. Armageddon isn't, it, Armageddon itself will be the mighty earthquake such as never was since men were upon the earth, that we will read about in Revelation, the 16th chapter and verse 18. <clears throat> this earthquake is a worldwide social revolution described in the scriptures as the greatest time of trouble the world has ever seen. Because in this uprising of the people, every man's hand will be against his neighbors, as the prophet Zechariah tells us in the eighth chapter in verse 10, which will sweep away every earthly institution and make way for the new heavens and the new earth. Now we come to the how. How does Armageddon come about? We are told in the prophetic picture that the world will be led to Armageddon by fear. Fear promoted by a church state government and the greatest coalition of power ever assembled in an attempt to save this present evil world and their exalted positions in it. Now, for the where, where will Armageddon take place? Well, there's no specific geographic location for this battle, but we're told that the trouble and distress will be first and especially upon the land of Christendom. Then it will spread to all nations. But we are given a geographic location of where Armageddon ends. The final blast, we are told, is in the land of Israel. Now we come to the why. Why is Armageddon necessary? For this important question, we're going to give a more detailed answer. The true constructive purpose of Armageddon is stated in a few words by the prophet Zephaniah in two parts. Let's read the first part in Zephaniah chapter 3 and verse 8. Therefore, Wait ye upon me, saith the Lord, until the day that I rise up to the prey, for my determination is to gather the nations that I may assemble the kingdoms to pour upon them mine indignation 
even all my fierce anger for all the earth shall be devoured with the fire of my jealousy. Brethren, this is the judgment of the nations, and they are found unworthy to continue on. So they're destroyed. What a sad and horrific story this would be if this was the end of the story. But the prophet is not finished. He tells us the rest of, the rest of the story, part two in verse nine, which reads, for then, that is after this destruction of the kingdoms of the present social and the present social order, will I turn to the people a pure language that they may all call upon the name of the Lord to serve him with one consent. How wonderful. After the destruction comes the blessing, the individual judgment for life eternal, which all the obedient of mankind will gain. Peter tells us the same story using different words in 2 Peter, the third chapter. Let's read verse 10. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat, the earth also, and the works that are therein shall be burned up. Again, this would be a horrific story if it ended here. But the apostle is not done. He tells us some very good news in verse 13. First Peter 2, verse 13. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness. Again, the kingdom and the blessings follow the destruction of this present evil world. We see in these two prophetic statements the true constructive purpose of Armageddon. First, to reveal to man their inability to govern themselves righteously, and then to cleanse the earth of these corrupt systems under Satan's control to make way for God's righteous kingdom. Now for our final question, when? When does Armageddon take place? The answer is, not yet, but soon. This is the answer that Brother Russell gave 109 years ago in the foreword of the fourth volume on page Roman numeral 15. And we believe it's, tr it's still true today, not yet, but soon. Brother Russell then went on to say, what prophetic events must be fulfilled before Armageddon could take place? Number one, the 2,520 years of Gentile rule must come to an end. And as we know, this was fulfilled in 1914 when the Gentile times did come to an end. And number two, Israel must be gathered and dwelling in unwalled villages. In, that is in safety from their enemies, their Arab, the Arab nations that surround them and desire to destroy them. The condition of Ezekiel, the 38th chapter. This condition must be fulfilled before Gog's final invasion can take place. And three, the vitalization of the image of the beast and the coming together of the beast, the false prophet, and the dragon forming the church state government of Revelation chapters 13 and chapter 16. These must still be accomplished. So in summary, in this big picture, we see that in the highly symbolic language of Revelation and of the Bible, Armageddon, Armageddon isn't a final great cataclysmic event as taught by so many. It's not doomsday or a nuclear holocaust that destroys heaven and earth along with the billions of unbelievers by a literal fire. Instead, 
God's kingdom of blessings will come to all who dwell upon the earth beyond Armageddon. What a wonderful message of hope we have to give, brethren. Now, let's consider some details and put some meat on these bones. Let me first remind you that this is a prophetic study, a study of future events. So we can't say with certainty how all these will work out because we can't be sure of the exact details until they happen. Therefore, reasonable minds can differ upon the events pictured and their timing. And secondly, this is a large subject. So we'll only be able to touch lightly upon it. That being said, we highly recommend to all the brethren the reading of the fourth volume for a detailed study of this topic. And one more thing. We read an interesting fact in reprint 5137. Here's the fact. The fourth volume of the studies in the scriptures will hereafter be entitled The Battle of Armageddon. This was a, this was a November 1912 reprint. What was the original title, brethren? The original title of the fourth volume was The Day of Vengeance. So why was this title changed? Well, Brother Russell made this change to capitalize on the fact that the, world, that the word Armageddon was frequently being used in society at that time. One last thing, a broad overview of the fourth volume that you can read in a September 1910 reprint, which reads, The Day of Vengeance shows that the disillusion of the present order of things is in progress, and that all the panaceas offered are valueless to avert the predicted end. End of quote. In other words, the present order is breaking up, and none of the suggested solutions will save it. Now, this is just as true today, brethren, as it was uh, over 100 years ago. Now, let's reconsider some of the details of our subject, Armageddon. We'll start by reading Revelation 16, 16, once again, this time from the American Standard Version of the Bible. which reads, and they gathered them together into a place which is called in the Hebrew, Har Mageddon. Brethren, what does the, the term Armageddon or Har Mageddon, H-A-R-M-A-G-E-D-O-N, what does this mean? It literally means hill or mountain of Megiddo. Har means mountain. Megiddo was a valley called Megiddo. It also means destruction in Hebrew. And this is very fitting. For example, good King Josiah was killed or destroyed by Pharaoh Necho at Megiddo, this mount of destruction. In one of the most disastrous conflicts in Israel's history. This is recorded for us in 2 Chronicles chapter 35, verses 22 to 25. In addition to this, Professor Strong says that this was a place of crowds or rendezvous, that is, gatherings. So putting it all together, Armageddon is a mountain and valley of destruction a place of gatherings where something is going to happen. Brother Russell reminds us on the opening page of the 1912 forward of the fourth volume that this was the location of the great battleground of Palestine, where many famous battles of Old Testament history were fought. 
There Gideon and his little band of 300 alarmed and confused the Midianites who destroyed one another in their flight. Judges 7, 19 to 23. There, King Saul was defeated by the Philistines. First Samuel chapter 31, the first 16 verses. It was here that King Ahab and his wife Jezebel lived in the city of Jezreel, where Jezebel afterwards met a horrible death. Second Kings chapter 9, verses 30 to 37. Here's an interesting fact. All these battles were won or lost with complete victories or with complete defeats. There were no ties. And in a sense, they were typical because they pictured something greater. So when we consider Gideon's victory, who fought with a mere 300 men and gained a complete victory, freeing Israel from the bondage of the Midianites, we learn that Gideon pictured our Lord Jesus and the 300 men pictured the glorified church who will release mankind from their bondage to sin and death. How wonderful. Next, we have a, the death of King Saul and the overthrow of his kingdom by the Philistines. Israel lost the battle. And it was a complete defeat for King Saul. So how was this a victory for God? Well, King Saul wasn't a good king. He started out good, but he wasn't a good king. So he had to be removed. And his defeat opened the way for the kingship of David, who, was, who typified the Messiah. This, we think, pictures the loss of Satan's kingdom, this present evil world, to the kingship of the great David, King Jesus. Next, we consider Jezebel, who was slain in the city of Jezreel in the same valley of Megiddo. This story is told in 2 Kings chapter 9, verses 30 to 37. It describes the awful end of the most despicable civil and false religious power structure in the history of Israel. In this story, King Ahab pictured civil power and Queen Jezebel, a worshiper of Baal, pictured the religious power of Israel. And we believe this pictures the awful end of a future church state government that will gain power for a short time and then be destroyed. And we'll talk about this in more detail later. Now let's recap what we've learned here. Armageddon will not be an actual final battle at a literal place. Armageddon is a metaphor for a future worldwide battle where righteousness will triumph over injustice. It will be a worldwide battle where everything opposed to God, God's kingdom, will fall. And though worldwide in scope, with many events happening close together, Armageddon's focus is upon the complete destruction of Christendom, followed by the destruction of the entire earth, its social structure. In eight words, Armageddon means a decisive, total, and final defeat of evil. Brethren, God chooses symbols carefully. Armageddon is no exception. Many great battles were fought, and many died on the battlefield of Megiddo, making it a fitting, symbolic place for the final conflict between good and evil, right and wrong, God and mammon. Although the word Armageddon only appears once, there are many biblical phrases that describe this worldwide conflict. Let's consider a few. Jesus described Armageddon as great tribulation in Matthew 24 and verse 21. Our Lord said, for then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since 
the beginning of the world to this time, no, nor ever shall be. Daniel described Armageddon as a time of trouble, such as never was since there was a nation, Daniel 12, 1. Isaiah says it will be a day of vengeance, Isaiah 63, 4. James says that in that day, the rich men shall weep and howl for their miseries that shall come upon them, James 5, the first six verses. And Malachi says, this day shall burn as an oven, and all that do wickedly shall be stubble, Malachi 4, 1. Joel tells us that the day of the Lord Jehovah will be a day of darkness and of gloominess, Joel 2 and verse 2. Amos describes it as a day of darkness and not light, Amos 5.20. And Jeremiah tells us that the earth shall tremble, Jeremiah 10 and verse 10. Who or what could possibly survive such an awful day as described here is the natural thought. To, uh, to the natural mind. But as terrible as this sounds, Armageddon is also the time God stands up for the people because his wrath is against the institutions that oppress and don't care, uh, care for the pe their people. So in this day of great trouble, the scales of justice will be balanced. As Brother Russell states, in the fourth volume on page 11, he says there, this day of vengeance described by the prophets is a day of national judgment and not individual judgment. For example, Jeremiah says that the Lord has a controversy with the nations, not individuals. Jeremiah 25, 31 to 33. Because the judgment of the world as individuals comes in the next stage, in the messianic age. Yet individuals make up nations and are largely responsible for the courses of nations. So individuals will suffer when this calamity, these calamities come upon the nations, especially the powerful, the influential who are most responsible. We want to consider a quote describing the object of volume four. But before we do, let's consider what isn't the object of this volume. What isn't the object of the fourth volume, the Battle of Armageddon? First, it wasn't written to stir up excitement or great fear or to gratify idle curiosity. And it wasn't written to change the hearts of men and bring about a positive change in the social, political, and religious order of society in order to save men from this coming wreck of this present evil world. Only God could do that. But he won't, brethren. And why not? because his intention is to remove this present kingdom and establish his own in its place. And in the process, he brings these bitter experiences upon man because they're necessary to instruct and prepare man's heart for these future blessings. Now for the quote describing the object of volume four, the Battle of Armageddon. This is from page 14 of the fourth volume. There, Brother Russell wrote, the main object of this volume is not, therefore, to enlighten the world, which can, uh, which can appreciate only the logic of events and will have no other, but to forewarn, forearm, comfort, encourage, and strengthen the household of faith so that they may not be dismayed, but may be in full harmony and sympathy with even the severest measures of divine discipline in the chastening of the world, seeing by faith the glorious outcome in the precious fruits of righteousness and enduring peace, 
the day of vengeance stands naturally related to the benevolent object of this divine permission, which is to overthrow the entire present order of things preparatory to the permanent establishment of the kingdom of God on earth under Christ, the Prince of Peace, end of quote. So we see that this 660 page volume of studies in the scriptures wasn't written to enlighten the world. Instead, it was written to forewarn, forearm, comfort, encourage, and strengthen us, brethren, the household of faith, so that we will not be distressed, but in harmony with God, even in the midst of the severest troubles that come upon the world. And why won't we be distressed? Because we know the glorious outcome, which is the end of this present evil world and the establishment of the kingdom of God on earth for the blessing of all mankind. Brethren, in this opening chapter, Brother Russell tells us that the time is at hand for all these things to be accomplished. Just as the prophet Isaiah stated, the year of my redeemed is come. It is the day of the Lord's vengeance and the year of recompense for the controversy of Zion. Isaiah 63, 4. Clearly, the Lord has been aware of this controversy, this strife and contention in nominal Zion, that is Christendom, all through the gospel age. He's seen his faithful saints contend for the faith and suffer persecution for righteousness sake at the hands of those who say they're doing the Lord's service. And he allows it for the proving and development of the saintly little flock. But he says, no more. The day of recompense has come, and the Lord has a controversy with them, as the prophet Hosea tells us in Hosea, the fourth chapter, the first three verses. Hosea 4, 1 through 3. The prophet says here, for the Lord hath a controversy with the inhabitants of the land, because there is no truth, no mercy, no knowledge of God in the land. By swearing and lying and killing and stealing and committing adultery, they break out and blood touches blood. Therefore shall the land mourn and everyone that dwelleth therein shall languish. Brethren, this prophecy was true in its fulfillment upon fleshly Israel, and it's true in its fuller sense in connection with nominal, nominal spiritual Israel, that is Christendom or Babylon. In this great controversy that will bring to, bring to a close this gospel age and usher in the messianic age, now we would like to read and consider the concluding paragraphs from study one, the day of vengeance found on page 20 in the fourth volume. There brother Russell writes in connection with Isaiah 34, this, which we'll read. And he quotes uh, Isaiah 34, one and two and verses seven and eight. Here again, the prophet Isaiah, concerning this controversy says, come near ye nations to hear and hearken ye people. Let the earth hear and all that is therein, the world and all things that come forth of it. And he inserts all the selfish and evil things that come of the spirit of the world. For the indignation of the Lord is upon all nations and his fury upon all the armies he hath, and now he's taking the future standpoint, here the prophet is, he has utterly destroyed them. He has delivered them to the slaughter, and their land shall be soaked with blood, and their dust made fat with fatness, for it is the day of the Lord's vengeance and the year of recompense for the controversy of Zion. And that's 
the end of our Isaiah 34 quote, and Brother Russell continues with this writing. He says, thus the Lord will smite the nations and cause them to know his power, and he will deliver his faithful people who go not with the multitudes in the way of evil, but who wholly follow the Lord their God in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation. And even this terrible judgment upon the world as nations, thus dashing them to pieces as a potter's vessel, will prove a valuable lesson to them when they come forth as in the, to an in individual judgment under the millennial reign of Christ. Thus, in this wrath, the Lord will remember mercy. End of quote. From these closing paragraphs, let's underline four important points. Number one, that the time has come for the grand reversal for the kingdoms of this world to become the kingdom of God. In this judgment of the nations, especially upon Christendom, everything evil will be dashed to pieces, that is, destroyed. In this judgment day, the saints will be delivered before the greatest part of this trouble comes. And fourth and finally, God's, God wounds to heal. Therefore, by this trouble, valuable lessons will be learned that will bless man in his individual judgment in the kingdom to follow. Let's turn back to our theme text and read it again along with the surrounding verses. Let's read together Revelation chapter 16, verses 12 to 21. And the friends will know the context. Chapter 16 of Revelation is the pouring out of the seven last plagues. And so we begin uh, after the first five have already been poured out and the sixth is poured out here. Verse 12 of Revelation 16. And the sixth angel poured out his vial upon the great river Euphrates and the water thereof was dried up that the way of the kings of the east might be prepared. And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, out of the mouth of the false prophet. For they are spirits of devils working miracles, which go forth unto the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to the battle of the great day of God Almighty. Behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he that watcheth and keepeth his garments, lest he walk naked, and they see his shame. Verse 16, and he gathered them together into a place called in the Hebrew tongue Armageddon. And the seventh angel poured out his vial into the air. And there came a great voice out of the temple of heaven from the throne saying, it is done. And there were voices and thunders and lightnings. And there was a great earthquake such as was not since men were upon the earth. So mighty an earthquake and so great. And the great city was divided into three parts and the city of the nations fell. And great Babylon came in remembrance before God to give unto her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath. And every island fled away and the mountains were not found. And there fell upon men a great hail out of heaven, every stone about the weight of a talent. And men blasphemed God because of the plague of the hail, for the plague thereof was exceeding great. Brethren, there's a lot here to digest, but let's start with a simple summary of the events described by these verses before taking a closer look at these symbols. First, we notice that the gathering of Armageddon occurs when the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet, this future church state government, band together to rule over the people in an attempt to keep the present social order from falling apart. Yet, their united effort has the opposite effect. It brings the world to Armageddon, which is described as the greatest earthquake ever 
in Revelation 16, verse 18. This great social revolution takes place after the seventh plague is poured out, verse 17, which becomes worldwide anarchy and tears down the entire social structure and removes the oppressive, greedy, and sinful institutions ruling over men. Now, let's take a closer look at the symbols, starting with the three agencies, the beast, false prophet, and dragon of Revelation 16, verse 13. Who is it that makes up this triple alliance whose words or croakings were, to, were told, gather the people of the world to Armageddon? For our purpose today, okay. we'll simply identify these symbols and refer you to the 1912 forward for a detailed study of this topic. Number one, the dragon represents the purely civil power. So the civil government of Rome, that is the nations known today as Christendom or Babylon. Two, the beast is the papal system of rule. A beast is the symbol used to represent a government throughout the Bible. And three, the false prophet. The false prophet is the Protestant Federation of Churches and is the same as the image of the beast. And it becomes the false prophet after being vitalized or receiving apostolic succession by the two-horned beast that is the Church of England and this story is told in Revelation 13, verses 11 and 15 for the short version. We'll read verse 11. And I behold another beast, and, well, we won't go there. We don't have the time. And I beheld another beast coming out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, and he spake as a dragon, that is, he spake as a civil government, a religious and civil government. Skipping down now to verse 15. And he, that is the two-horned beast, had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship, the image of the beast should be killed. And we'll speak more of this later. Now, what is this? What is symbolized by the unclean spirits like frogs that came out of the mouth of the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet? Well, these croakings or utterances that bring the kingdoms of earth to the great battle of Armageddon, the spirit is a doctrine. An unclean spirit is therefore a false doctrine. Each of these systems will croak or they'll say the same things with the characteristics of frogs. And you can read it, like we said, the details of that in the forward of the fourth volume, the 1912 forward. They'll speak with an air of superiority, wisdom, and knowledge. What will they say? They will speak of the divine authority of the church and the divine right of kings to rule. They will say, follow us. We will take care of you. You just have to give up your rights and liberties. Bow down to us. That is, take the mark of Revelation 13, 16. Cooperate with us and all will be well. This message will be croaked continuously from the pulpits and press of, of the religious as well as the civil government, from the electronic media, invoking fear of the people. They will warn all that if their counsel isn't followed, the result will be tragic because everything will fall apart and they will have their hour of power. As we read and are told in Revelation, the 17th chapter. Let's read verse 12, Revelation 17, 12. 
in the ten horns which thou sawest are ten kings, which have received no kingdom as yet, but receive power as kings one hour with the beast. We think that this is another picture of the future church-state union. The ten horns are the civil powers of Christendom, or Babylon, and the beast represents the religious powers. And we're told in Revelation 17, 13, that these, the civil powers, have one mind and shall give their power and strength unto the beast, that is, the Catholic and Protestant churches united. In connection with this, future power of the church and state over the people, we'll read a short quote from the fourth volume uh, forward, page Roman numeral 13. There, Brother Russell writes, for a brief time, as we understand the scriptures, these combined forces of Armageddon will triumph. Free speech, free males, and other liberties will have come to, to be the very breath, which have come to be the very breath of the masses in our day will be ruthlessly shut off on the plea of necessity, the glory of God, the commands of the church, and so on. The safety valve will be set upon and thus will cease to annoy earth's kings and the sound of escaping steam, and all will seem to be serene until the great social explosion described in the revelation as the, an earthquake will take place. In symbolic language, an earthquake signifies social revolution. And the scriptural declaration is that none like it ever before occurred. Revelation 16, 18 to 90. See our Lord's reference to it in Matthew 24, 21. And of course, that's the great tribulation such as never was. Now, end of quote. Before this earthquake erupts, it will be the time of the enforced mark of the beast, which comes after the image is vitalized. Now, this story is told in Revelation, the 13th chapter, and we'll read verses 15 to 17 now. And he, that is the two-horned beast, had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. And he caused all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their forehead, and that no man might buy or sell in this, that is in the spiritual marketplace, which is our words, save he that had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Now the mark on the right hand and forehead indicates a support or allegiance to the beast, that is the false church, and public confession to their claims of divine authority. Those who refuse to cooperate will be punished in some way, maybe with a religious, social, political, or financial boycott. In this connection, Brother Russell writes in the second volume, page 263, it would not surprise, be surprising if a strong government would someday replace this republic and one common standard of religion, religious belief, be deemed expedient to teach outside of which will be treated and punished as a political offense. End of quote. Brethren, we, the saints of God, will not take this mark. The saints will instead speak the truth and point out that this illicit union is not ordained of God. This future witness of the church is pictured by the John the Baptist message, who is the type, who in the type, pointed out the illicit union between Herod and Herodias, Matthew chapter 14, verses three and four. This future work is also pictured by Elijah, smiting the Jordan in 2 Kings 2.8. In the symbolic language in the Bible, water represents both truth and people. And this smiting we understand to mean a mighty future work by the final feet members of the church, the Elijah class, who will use what is in their hands. What is in our hands, dear friends? 
the power and authority of the truth, the power of God in smiting the waters, that is the peoples who will be judged by the truth. Brother Russell writes in question book 387 that the smiting will probably affect the whole civilized world, dividing the people. That is the truth will be received by some and rejected by others. This future witness of the church is also pictured by the pouring out of the seven last plagues of Revelation 16, which we believe are seven doctrines or seven truths. These truths will be poured out or spoken by the final feet members and by God's timing and power pictured by the vials or the bowls, they will plague and destroy Babylon, Christendom. After this final message is given, the dark night of John 9-4 will set in. Then all opportunities to speak the truth publicly, to buy or sell in the spiritual marketplace, will be forcibly closed down by the powers that be, by the strong hand of the church state government, Revelation 13-17. This closing work of the church and their loss of freedom to speak the truth is foreshadowed by the imprisonment of John the Baptist, Matthew 14, 3. This time when the true church boldly delivers this final message that plagues Babylon will be the time of their separation from the great company class who are not prepared for this work. This separation is also pictured by the separation of the wise and foolish virgins the wise having the oil that is the spirit of full consecration in their hearts, but the foolish did not. Revela or Matthew 25, verses 8 to 10. The separation of the little flock and the great company is also pictured by the separation of Elijah from Elisha in 2 Kings 2, verse 11. When Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven, picturing that the close of the church's career in the flesh will come suddenly, abruptly. The fire may signify that the last members of the church will be separated under very trying circumstances, that is, fiery trials of persecution and violence. When the church is off the scene, the great company class remains behind to go through the great tribulation, Revelation 7 in verse 14. Saddened by the realization that they have lost the great prize, they, they soon recover, as we read in Revelation 19 and verse 7. Now here, this is the great company class speaking in Revelation 19, 7, saying, let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him, for the marriage of the Lamb has come and his wife has made herself ready. Now, why did the great company class rejoice? Well, it's because their eyes have been opened by the light of the truth that plagued Babylon, by these hard plaguing truths of Revelation 16 poured upon Babylon, they see Babylon as they never saw her before. And they see God's plan as they never saw it before. This awakens them from their slumber and separates them from Babylon. And now inspired by the word of God, his loving plan, they buy of the oil, Matthew 25, eight to 11. They wash their robes and make them white in the blood of the lamb by passing through the great tribulation for their correction, for their purification. By God's mercy, these foolish virgins are saved by fire. They prove their love and loyalty by the discipline and stress of this final test. They are faithful unto death, although they are forced to make their stand. Although the great company class are awakened and thank the Lord, others, the terror class, are angered and plagued by these truths, and they blaspheme God, we're told, in Revelation 16.21. This will be the time of their burning that we read of in Matthew 13, 30, and 40. 
the seven last plagues will show these professed Christians that they never were Christians or nor were the churches God's representatives. They had been lied to all along and angered by this great deception, they returned to the world and these burned tares joined the ranks of the Lord's great army by which God tears down the present order the sea into which Babylon is hurled with violence as described in Revelation 18.21. First Babylon is lifted up. They have that hour of power and then they're cast down into the sea and destroyed and they never rise again. Uh, that Dan Monot? Yes. Uh, try to, yes. Uh, please try to finish it. Brother. Okay, all right. Yeah. All right. Well, dear friends, uh, we are sorry we didn't use our time wisely. We will uh, uh, we will try to bring this to a conclusion here in the next couple of minutes. Um, well, we will say just as we mentioned earlier that in the timing of the events, Armageddon. It has no geographic location, uh, but the ending of Armageddon does. And as we know, uh, the ending of Armageddon, the final battle, uh, takes place in Israel. And we read of this prophetic event in one place in Ezekiel, the 38th chapter, where we have the hordes of Gog and Magog coming against Israel, who are gathered in unwalled villages. That means they're gathered in safety at this time when the, the world is in anarchy. Israel is enjoying uh, safety and prosperity. And so God comes down. God brings them down uh, for this final lesson that Israel needs to learn, to trust God and not her lovers. And uh, we are will read uh, a quick quote from uh, the fourth volume, page 554, on this final battle. Uh, Brother Russell writes there, but yet one more wave of anguish must pass over the chastened people, for according to the uh, according to the prophet, the final conflict of battle of the great day will be in the land of Palestine. And when law and order are swept away, Israel will finally be besieged by the host of merciless plunders, plunderers designated by the prophet as the host of Gog and Magog, Ezekiel 38. And great will be the distress of defenseless Israel. Alas, says the prophet Jeremiah, for the day is great, so that none is like it. It is even the time of Jacob's trouble, but he shall be saved out of it, Jeremiah 30 and verse 7. Brethren, it's in the midst of this great trouble when all seems lost, that God will reveal himself as Israel's defender, as we read in Zechariah 14, 2 and 3, for I will gather all nations against Jerusalem to battle, and the city shall be taken, and the houses rifled, and the women ravished, and half of the city shall go, go forth into captivity, and the residue, that is, the faithful of remnant of the people, shall not be cut off from the city." At this psychological moment, these faithful ones will uh, pray to God. Then, says the prophet in verse 3 of Zechariah 14, shall the Lord go forth and fight against those nations as when he fought in the days of battle. Jehovah gains the victory here over Israel's enemies, Gog and his hordes, as told in Ezekiel 38, and brings Armageddon, the universal insurrection, to an end revealing his great power to Israel and the world. Then he will establish his, co his new covenant with the resurrected ancient worthies and the faithful remnant of Israel, Jeremiah 31, 31. And through this chosen nation and their princes, Messiah's kingdom will be carried to all parts of the world. In this way, God will bring blessings to all mankind rolling away the curse and lifting up mankind, giving him beauty for ashes. And in that day, the desire of all nations shall come. We will conclude as we began, brethren, although the world 
will be overwhelmed by this unexpected catastrophe called Armageddon. We will not. Why? Because we are children of light and we see the hope beyond Armageddon. We see this worldwide trouble, not the end of mankind, but a new beginning, the beginning of man's eternal blessings. May the Lord add his blessing. <clears throat> Thank you, uh, Brother Dan Monat, for your wonderful discourse on Armageddon. Of course, we all know it is a very large topic and a very great topic. And finishing this discourse within 45 minutes will be a great task. And uh, thanks for uh, uh, taking this wonderful discourse for us. <laughs>